Tara. Um, we've been focusing on a concept called winery direct, which is our way of bringing wines into the United States uh, directly from the producers right into the US market on a distributor by distributor basis. We work nationally. We work exclusively with Italian wines and spirits. And uh, we work with about 60 distributors throughout the United States, focusing on family owned wineries, focusing on wineries that uh, are icons in their area. And uh, it's a portfolio that, uh, that I put together 30 years ago after working uh, as the winemaker at Cado Bosco in Northern Italy, uh, which is a sparkling wine facility. Um, had an opportunity to do that after working for UC Davis, uh, working for studying at UC Davis. And uh, it's been a real treat to be involved in the wine business for 35 years in Italy, particularly for 30. I also want to thank our team uh, at Dolaterra nationally uh, and our production team here that helps bring this together today. Grazie mille. Um, let's focus on Adami. Let's focus on uh, the Prosecco region, um, which is in Northern Italy. And uh, we'll bring a map up here in just a sec to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Um, it's kind of that gray area right there. And for those of you who are familiar with just a few cities in Italy, uh, Milan and Venice are probably in, uh, in your repertoire. And you can see it right here, very, very close to Northeastern Italy, um, to the north of the Alps and to the south is the Adriatic Sea. And located right here in the hills that uh, Enrico will talk about in just a minute, um, are these incredible, steep, amazing vineyards. They're very chaotic vineyards. These are vineyards that, um, that follow the, the, uh, the topography of the land. Um, when we were looking for a Prosecco producer, it was probably about 15 years ago. And we began looking and talking. Usually what I do is I talk to friends and I kind of find out who's who, um, who do people live out there? Who do they love? And one after another came back and said, wow, you know, if Adami's available, that's really who you want to work with. Um, like the other producer we work with, it's family owned and uh, not just a leader in the area, but Franco Adami was the president of the consortium. And back in 2007, when they, 2009, perhaps, when they, um, when they expanded the region and changed the, uh, the actual name of the Prosecco grape to Glare, it was Franco Adami that led that. So we're working with people, um, with all of our producers that tend to be leaders in their region. Um, it's family owned. Franco and his brother uh, Armando own and direct and run the winery. And now their kids are involved. So it's a, obviously a multi-generational project. Um, these are people that live right there. When I say right there, I mean, at the cellar, I mean, a hundred meters from the cellar, the families live right there. This is not a, a telecommute kind of thing. This has uh, um, been that way for generations. And they were the first winery to begin working with, um, with single vineyard crews with the uh, Vigneto Giardino uh, wine that came out in 1933. So this is a, a leader in the area. They do about a hundred fermentations a year. And uh, it's been a real treat to watch this winery grow and evolve over the uh, 15 years that we've worked with them. Uh, it's clearly not all due to Dalaterra, but to the, uh, to the growth of Italian sparkling wines in general with a little bit of sweetness that Enrico will talk about in just a moment. Examples of those wines could be, besides Prosecco, there's Moscato d'Asti and Lambrusco, all Italian, all sparkling, all on the sweet side, and they've all taken America by storm. Um, Enrico, tu sei la face dell'azienda in giro per il mondo, non sì. preoccuparti. So I'd like to invite uh, our dear friend Enrico Valafero, uh, who's worked with the Dami for well over a decade, I don't know, 12 years, something like that, 13 years or something. Um, he's been in the United States many, many, many times, understands our market impeccably. And uh, Enrico, you prepared for us um, a way of sharing, a very unique way, I think, of uh, sharing with us uh, the intricacies of, of your world over there. So at this moment, I have to pass it on to Enrico. Prego. Grazie, Brian. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, I'm Enrico Valleferro. I've been with Adami, as Brian said, for 13 years. There is always in our lives uh, a first time. This uh, today for me, it's a double first time. It's the first time I do such a meeting uh, with uh, over 200 people watching and listening to me. And the other first time is me 
talking, wearing a Galatera hat, but I do this simply because I had a hair, handmade haircut at home, which is not a good haircut. So I'm thankful to Brian that gave me a Galatera hat. That being said, okay, that's great, Brian. <laughs> that's teamwork. So I'm gonna talk uh, today about Adamia, specifically about the Valdobbiadene and Conagliano area. Uh, saying that when Brian said before that uh, Franco Adami was president in 2009 of the DOC Conagliano Valdobbiadene, he was uh, very right. Uh, I want to add to that that 40 years before, so 1969, that's when Conagliano Valdobbiadene became DOC. So it's been at either DOC or DOCG lately for 51 years. We celebrated last year 50 years of the our hills being Conagliano uh, Valdobbiadene and protected. Um, some people don't know that Prosecco has been made for two, 300 years. There is not really an, a starting date, but um, I brought with me and I'm trying to show you some homemade slides by putting them close to the camera. You don't necessarily have to read what's written on it, but it's just a kind of more a visual of a visual. Uh, presentation. So this is, I found one of the first books. This is 1874, a book written by two winemakers uh, and professors in Conegliano, where 1876, the first technological school of Italy was founded. So 140 years ago, the, the oldest technological school was made in Conegliano, 30 kilometers from us. And people were starting learning and appreciating a great variety called back then Prosecco, now it's called Glera, but all we do, we do with this grape. Uh, the Prosecco nowadays is uh, a wine in the wine region. Uh, you can only make it in that specific wine region. So think at uh, Bourgogne for France, it's a wine region. Pinot Noir you can make everywhere, but Bourgogne is only in Bourgogne. Think at Chianti Classico, Barolo, Prosecco, if you go on Google map and you zoom Northeast Italy, this is just a, a, a simple Googling, you see the sea on the south, you see the Alps on the north, in between, so between north from Venice and east and west from Venice, that's the area where you can do, produce Prosecco. Uh, that area, imagine, I'm gonna show you this, which is, might sound confusing to you, but imagine that each square is a village. This shows 556 villages, 95 of which are in the province of Treviso, 15 of which the dark uh, green ones are the hilly region, Conegliano Valdobbiadene, and our company works since uh, 100 years, only in three villages. So what we are gonna see today and talk about today is uh, the micro areas and the terroir of those three villages. Um, I show you this. This is a kind of a cake where you can, uh, of the different appellations of Prosecco. So you have the Prosecco DOC, DOC Treviso. You have a DOCG called Asolo, Conegliano Valdobbiadene DOCG. And then you've got the single vineyards, the Rive and the Cartizze. So if you look at the, or the lower part of the cake, that's the DOCG area. That's where we are talking about today. In order for you to remember that area, I'm gonna show you the crocodile on a map. So if you Google and zoom in to our region, you will see a crocodile tail. That crocodile tail, to make it simple, out of the Prosecco world is, I call it, this is a new tool I found out today. This is the VAT or the, the, let's say the VAT is 15%, for example, the crocodile tail, the Prosecco Superiore, the hilly area for Prosecco in general is 15% of the total of the production. So of course you have Prosecco in the 556 uh, villages. That's where most Prosecco comes from, but 15% of it comes from the hilly area. Uh, so if you Google in, uh, basically north of Venice, you Google in and you Google in, you see east-west between the two names, Conegliano Valdobbiadene, you see kind of a crocodile tail. You see an up and down of hills. I'm not sure if you can see it, I hope you can, but I can swear 
you, you can see these hills, east, west, and these uh, uh, going up and down, creating this kind of crocodile tail. And the end of the crocodile tail, the east part of that of those hills is exactly the vineyards where we produce our wines. So the three villages that you see highlighted here, you don't have to remember the names, but this is a micro area of five kilometers, six kilometers, where all our wines are made. Uh, our Garvel, which is a Brut Traviso, is made in the flat area. You clearly see the flat area here. On the hilly area, we do our DOCG wines. So that's basically uh, where Adami, since 1920, produces its wines. Uh, I'm not sure you can see very good this picture, but this just shows you the Vigneto Giardino, for example. This is one of our vineyards. This is the same vineyard, but it's winter time. Just to give you an idea that when I say steep, I mean steep. This is springtime, the Vigneto Giardino. Okay, this is obviously in the fall. And this is, for example, the Colcredas Vineyard. So when I say steep, I mean this kind of hills. Uh, I'm, I would love with you to explain you why it's important for us to stick in these three villages after 100 years. And I'm trying to do this showing you one, uh, two slides actually. So if you have a, a flat area with one soil, uh, so imagine the erosion that takes millions of years of time, the old area from here to Venice, which is south from us, it's flat and it's basically one soil or soil type. It's basically the same temperature swings. It's basically the same grape. It's the same vintage. It's very similar growing conditions. So if you make it in one place or the other place, I don't think in the vineyards there might be a, a big difference. But if you're, so from this situation, you go to this situation, here you see different soils, you see different um, hills, hills that can be higher or that can be lower, hills that can be southeast facing, southwest facing, and eventually with different layers of soil. So I brought you here just to see, I'm not sure if you're able to see this kind of soil or this kind of soil. These are just examples. We, we are not going into the details today, but you know, depending where and depending which hills and the elevation of the hills, you have different soils. So many producers will tell you this and you know from Bordeaux to Brunello to Barolo, how soils uh, are different and the microclimates right. are different. Uh, but I like to show more also pictures. So one, a uh, very important picture is to grow on hills or flat means more or less sunlight, more or less um, kind of help for the vegetation from the sun. So our, another slide that I'm gonna show you is for example, this. This is the 15 villages, the area of Conegliano Valdobbiadene uh, last year, just before harvesting. Again, I don't wanna go too much into the details of what this is, but this is, malic acidity, tartaric acidity, residual sugar, different parameters. And you see how from Valdobbiadene to Conegliano, east to west, how the color changes, okay? So uh, one, two, three, 30 kilometers away, the colors change quite dramatically. And then you see the same area a week later, so the 3rd of September, see how the color change, okay? So you see how the acidities or the uh, sugar levels have changed, perhaps making some areas ready to be harvested, but maybe some other vineyards not ready to be harvested. So the growing conditions really make a big difference for any wine, but also for, uh, of course, for Prosecco di Conegliano Valdobbiadene. This is um, our three villages area last year. You see difference in the, this is the malic acidity, for example, this is five kilometers from here to here, five, six kilometers. See how it can be different. And this is only maybe one mile. And then you see a week later, the places where they are more or less ready to be harvested. So yes, we work in three villages, but we have, and we harvest and we obtain from those three villages on average um, 34 separate vinifications, first fermentations. 
So first from this spot maybe, or this other spot, depending on the growing conditions on the vintage, we harvest earlier or later in specific places, obtaining different base mines. This is very important for uh, the cuvee that we will do then at the end of the year. Some other uh, visual things that I wanted to share with you. This is, for example, the rainfall in different vintages in the Valdobbiaden area. So, okay, there are different growing conditions, but also the vintages are different. So don't, you, don't think that Prosecco tastes every year the same. It's the same as Chianti, same as uh, Nero Davola, same as um, Barolo. So every year is then different. So every year you harvest sooner or later. If you look at the average rainfall between Conegliano and Valdobbiadene, you see how it can be different. So obviously the growing conditions from here to 30 kilometers away from here can be dramatically different. And this is very, uh, very important. Another thing that all these things that I showed you, I found them on this book, which was made almost about 10 years ago. It's a uh, two, 300, two, 300 uh, uh, pages book. The book with the terroir of Conegliano Valdobbiadene. The book shows you all these differences and maps from the different areas. And the study of the, of the soil, of the, um, of the rainfall, of the humidity, from all the different rive, from all the different micro places in our 15 villages. It's a very interesting book. I mean, it's, uh, I found many, many interesting things. And specifically they study the micro villages because since 2009, producers are allowed to write on their label, not only Prosecco, not only Valdobbiadene Prosecco Superiore. If they want to, they can add on the label the name Rive, Rive means hills in our, uh, in our dialect. You specify Rive, the hills, and then you specify the village. So this is Rive di Farra di Soligo, our Colcredas, for example. And this would be the Vigneto Giardino, which is Rive di Cordartaldo. They are five, six kilometers away, different growing conditions, different soils, two different products. One is bone dry, the other one, we will see later, it's more about the fruit salad, the, the complexity of the aromatics. <laughs> Some other differences I wanted to show you. This is, for example, a map showing seven, actually eight, let me check, eight different villages within the area and the average for that year of uh, how much the rain stays in the soil. So some areas had not enough water, kind of like not at that, in that year and at that point. Some other areas, they had enough water considering the year. So again, you see differences from one place to the other. Other differences are the temperatures, of course, okay? Because the higher you have a vineyard, the more you have temperature swings. Temperature swings means um, more or less intensity, more or less acidity in the wines. This is valid from Alto Adige to Conegliano Valdobbiadene to Champagne. Uh, it's a latitude thing, but it's also an altitude thing. And <clears throat> luckily in Conegliano Valdobbiadene, we have uh, vineyards that are 100, 150 meters above sea level up to 450 meters above sea level. So again, we have the difference in altitude. Difference in altitude makes also a difference in the humidity that you have from the uh, valley floor up to the hills. So again, a, another difference. The next map is Conegliano Valdobbiadene. And again, this shows you the average um, temperatures in the different areas. See how Conegliano this way is warmer on average, then you've got some kind of milder and then some colder areas or fresher areas. And this is the maximum temperatures in the same area. I repeat again, this map is about 20 miles times five, six, seven miles. It's really a small area. It's the 15 villages out of, out of the 556. All that being said, when, uh, again, to show it visually, when I say wines are different, <clears throat> when I say taste profiles are different, um, here, again, in the same book, I found an interesting uh, sheet showing the uh, tasting notes of the grapes. So when people go in the vineyards and taste and eat the grapes, 
there is a way of judging them um, in terms of the acidity of the grape, in terms of the acidity of the pulp of the grape, or the herbaceous on the pulp, or the attitude of being uh, pressed. I mean, it's basically a tasting that tells you, am I harvesting in this vineyard today, tomorrow, do I wait a couple of days? So for example, this, you see how you can judge. You don't need to read necessarily, but it just shows you how, how in different moments, a vineyard might be ready or not to be harvested. Specifically for sparkling wines, which is what we do, and in this part of the world, uh, it's crucial to have to harvest when the acidity is at its high, highest point, kind of like. So we don't look for um, sugar level, which means alcohol. We look more for other parameters, which are acidity, which means freshness for the end product. And we look more for the balance of the fruitiness of the aromatics of the grape. So we need to harvest when the malic and the tartaric acidity is still going up. And once it starts going down, which would be good for still wine, in that moment we harvest because as Franco Adami likes to say, and since I'm with him, he told me hundreds of times, I don't make vino. Io non faccio vino. Io faccio base spumante. Which is, to make it simple, it's like, I don't make a Ducati, I make Vespa. Yes, they're both motorbikes, but one objective is to do a fast one, which is a Ducati, the other one is to do a Vespa. So if your goal is a sparkling one, you need a good base spumante, not a good vino. Yes, Basel Spumante is alcoholic and it's basically like a wine, but it's an ideal base for the sparkling wine, which I, I repeat, you need good acidity and other components, not necessarily alcohol. So again, I show you, for example, how people here taste the base wines. So of course, when tasting base wines, you can have um, the apples, you can have flowers, you can have the intensity, you can have the tropical, you can have the pear, the peach. There are many different things that we taste in our base wines, depending on the spots and depending on the harvesting days. And for example, here, I'm going to show you a map <clears throat> of the acidity and the sugar contents. The difference here is shown between different vintages. You see how the uh, yes, the place is important, but also the vintage makes the difference. So some vintages you have to harvest earlier, or you will have more bigger bodied wines or lighter wines, but maybe with a, with a higher acidity. So all these parameters are really, really important. And I don't normally to see, I don't normally get to see those kind of things because I'm not a winemaker. I'm more, of course, I, I travel around and I, I'm more a commercial guy. But all these things uh, for people that make the wine, they are very important and they study all day and every year, year after year, in order to make the best possible wine. Uh, here we're gonna see, for example, 98 and 99. This is the, some tasting notes from eight different Rive, eight different places in 2009, uh, 1998, for example. It doesn't matter the year, but it shows you different colors, which are the finesse, the intensity, the acidity, the sapidity, the balance of the wines in the different areas. So this is 98, for example, in different parts of Conegliano Valdobbiadene. See how the different colors are not in the same place because it's different places. And this would be 99. Okay, so 98 and 99 were not the same vintage as for every other wine in the world. But often people think for sake of thing, okay, it's it's like a Heineken, it tastes always the same. It's, it's not really like that, you know? So to go specifically into our Vigneto Giardino, into the place where we started, this is the, the Scandolera area, which has different crews, one of which is the Giardino. And again, you see the average for the Conegliano Valdobbiadene and the specific taste profile of this micro area. Okay, so those are, those are all visual things for you to understand one kilometer from the other can be different. Sure, sure. Uh, another important aspect that I'm almost done is, uh, for example, two different places and two different harvesting moments. So of course the two colors are not the same, plus they made uh, an experiment of harvesting in one moment 
and in another moment. So of course you see uh, some parameters going up and some going down. So you see more or less acidity, more or less sugar in different places. So it's crucial for in our region uh, to go and harvest uh, in the best possible moment. That's why we have four small presses because in the two, three weeks when we harvest, we bring in uh, on average 34 separate base wines. We don't, we cannot, we could, but we can, we don't go in the same day in the same place because it would taste all the same or kind of like. Each place has its best possible moment. And this is again, a tasting of uh, wines uh, harvested in different moments. So not only you need the good soils, not only you need the right moment, uh, it's really about finding the best possible day and the best possible spot. Uh, the next one is the Vigneto Giardino. Again, this is our oldest vineyard. We are the first company ever to make a single vineyard here. 1933, over 80 years ago, almost 90 years ago. In this vineyard, we restarted about 10 years ago, a project. The project is all about replanting new vines, but you can decide to replant new vines basically saying, I, I need some glera, such as you would say, I need some Chardonnay or Pinot Bianco, or you can do your muscle selection of your old uh, vines and reproduce your own. Uh, uh, vines and keep your DNA for the future, for the fourth generation, for the fifth generation. This is a project that we restarted and that we are very proud of because we think it's uh, it's really transporting and giving the future, the, the past to, to the future generations. Um, I, what am I going to show you next? I'm going to show you this one. The interpretation of the soil means that in the Colcredas uh, vineyard, which is in Farra di Soligo, we have sapidity with a touch of lemon, with some Mediterranean herbs, uh, the sage, normally the basil, these kind of things, and we have minerality. So in that vineyard, in for that base wine, with that base wine, Franco Adami says, what can I do with this? With these characteristics, it makes sense to make something drier because I've got the body for it. For many different reasons, we make an extra brood, for example. You go five kilometers away, you are in the Vigneto Giardino, the vineyard I just showed you, you've got white flowers, for example. These are just examples, but more or less, that's how it is from year to year. You've got a couple of oranges, you've got a couple of peaches, you've got what we call the fruit salad. It's, it's a vineyard that seems uh, that for over hundred years, it's been, it always had in its uh, vineyard, the complexity on already. So the, we call it the fruit salad, the Macedonia, uh, which means when you get a lot, the difference is basically, sorry, this is intensity of aromas, which is good. This is complexity of aromas. So we like the intensity, but we prefer the complexity. This vineyard has the complexity on its own. It has the uh, a good acidity, and it allows us to make something clean, uh, fruity, yes, ar almost aromatic, yes, creamy, yes, but it's also asciutto, which means it leaves your palate clean. A well-made Prosecco should never leave you sweetness here. Uh, when it comes to sweetness, I show this. Please forget about numbers. Don't ask me, is this how many sugar, uh, residual sugar is this or that? The important thing for a champagne, for a Moscato, for a Prosecco, for any wine or still wine is the balance. Is, are you happy with this wine? Does it taste good? Does it leave your palate clean? Or are you eventually not so happy or not so convinced about it? Some vintages, the Vigneto Giardino is 22 grams of sugar. Some vintages is 17, who knows? We have to see next year how the acidity goes, how the temperature swings goes and all these kind of things. So the important thing is always the balance. <clears throat> and I hope you'll be able to read this. I won't comment it until you read it. <laughs> I hope you all got it. Oh, that's awful. It says, yes, you know, 
there is always someone that can do it cheaper. You can buy cheaper pasta, you can buy cheaper uh, mozzarella, you can buy cheaper pizza, you can buy cheaper everything. The concept with Prosecco, which is still very interesting nowadays, is that the cheapest one in the US will be $10 retail, but the top one will be 2022, maybe 25, which yes, it's double as much, but it's 25, it's not 250. So we never made this battle, which is, uh, and that's why we stick in our three villages. We like to make the best possible Dios de Treviso, the best possible single vineyards, because we like, as Federica Pellegrini, not win every year, but we like to be always in the Olympics and play the Olympics and be within the good producers. We have been doing this for three generations. Generation number four is just here, uh, is the IT manager today, both of them. So we hope to, to be like Federica Pellegrini and to be in the Olympics also for the, for the near future. Uh, as you notice, I didn't talk at all pretty much about winemaking because uh, you all know pretty much how wine is made, more or less, but we can do and talk about it for another half an hour, that's no problem. But the point today was Prosecco, yes, but from where? I know it's Prosecco, but it's Prosecco from Madobiadene from Conegliano, is it? This is the question. Okay, so there, there is all, most Prosecco is good nowadays. <clears throat> it doesn't have big problems or, or reductions or so. But if you take Prosecco Superiore, that 15%, so 15 bottles out of 100, they probably might have a little bit more of character, a little bit more of history, and a little bit more of uh, terroir driven taste profiles. I think that was my 20 minutes, Brian. I made my best to, to say an Italian to talk just for 20 minutes is really almost, almost, almost wedding, you know, so. <laughs> you, just, you just get rolling there. So a couple of takeaways before we go to some questions for me. Um, it's a very interesting idea that what we're talking about here is one grape, the Glera grape, grown in many, many different, different uh, environments, different vineyards, different exposures, different... Uh, Soil types, different steepnesses, different elevations on the hills, on the plains. But we're focusing on one thing and we're focusing on how this evolves and, and differentiates itself from vintage to vintage, from site to site. Um, and in the end, we're still looking to create, um, except for one sulievito, which is one which actually fermented to dryness in the, on the leaves. We're creating proseccos across the board, different styles, different mouthfeels, different expressions of the glera grape. Um, and it's very different than let's take uh, your neighbors to the north. So to the north of you is Alto Adige, and you know they have 20 different grape varietals up there, um, and you're looking at different exposures, but you're also looking at different expressions of varietals. You guys are focused singularly like a laser beam on what Glera can do in your hills um, and, in, and in, your, uh, in your flat regions there as, as the uh, Prosecco regions expanded. And that's a fascinating, fascinating thing. And then you're adjusting this vintage to vintage um, as you're picking, uh, as you're deciding on pick dates and things like that. So we're looking for overall consistency. So when we're looking at a bottle of Adami, we're looking at, uh, we, 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 we expect the same level of quality, the same complexity, the same um, intermingling of, of, of bright acidity and fruit salad and longevity um, in these wines and the persistence of these wines. Um, and yet at the same time, what you're, you're, the, the cards, basically the deck is shuffled with every vintage. Um, and historically you have an idea of what you're getting from certain vintages, excuse me, from certain vineyards. But it's a very interesting puzzle because at the end of the day, you're trying to build a similar puzzle with somewhat different pieces, vintage after vintage, as opposed to a region where they have so many different varietals that they're planting um, in different areas. So I wanted to get that get that point across um, to a lot of people as, as we're thinking about Glera. Um, can you just say a couple of words about Glera in terms of it's it's really only grown in this area? And keep in mind, you guys, we're talking about at least for for Adam, we're talking about a three mile little area that they're, you know, five kilometers. It's a very, very small area that they, as an organization are working within. Um, the, the Prosecco area, the region, the DOC and DOCG is much larger, obviously, but these guys are incredibly focused on, on, on what they're doing. And the real difference, I think, between 
um, Adami and many of the, the large producers, because what we find in your backyard is we find a lot of, of very, very large industrial um, producers. Um, and they're really what's driven the recognition of Prosecco. And I just took my hat off. I, I may as well have taken it off to them because they're the ones that put Prosecco on the map. And we love that. Um, just as Santa Margarita put Pinot Grigio on the map in the United States, um, a number of these other large brands have done that for, for Prosecco. And that's a very important, uh, an important role to get it out to the masses. And then um, estates such as Adami are taking that to the next level. And you have been taking the next level for about 100 years. So in terms of small, family-owned and operated, estate-grown, um, well, I, I may be biased, but I think you guys are at the top of the heap of, uh, of what you're working there. So Glara has really only grown in that area. Does anyone make a still Glara or are they all um, focused on, on Prosecco in that area? Yeah, so quickly about the last question. Some people still produce like 0.1% of still Glara. Uh, mm -hmm. When I first uh, started the presentation, I talked about 1870 something, 1874. Uh, in fact, uh, you said we only make Lara here today, and that's true, uh, at least for the past, I don't know, 50 years, maybe more than that. But I'm going to show you, I'm not sure you're going to see exactly um, the names, but you will see a map of the province of Treviso, 1874. You will see colors of red and white, and those are the grape varieties. So here you see names of grape varieties white grape varieties, red grape varieties of 150 years ago. And this is the province of Treviso. You see out here there, are, there is more red on the map and the north part there is more white, which means they made more red here and more white up on the hills. So 150 years ago, there was here 25 different grape varieties as a matter of fact. When they made, the, this is the first kind of research they made here. So we did have many grape varieties, but uh, end of the 18th century and then World War I, World War II, eventually the big winner was the Glera. Probably because the growing conditions were perfect, temperatures, tem temperatures, wings, hills, uh, and probably because of the taste profile of the grapes. So there was other grape varieties. There are still a few of indigenous grape varieties that are allowed to use in a Prosecco Superiore. Verdizio, Pereira, Bianchetta, uh, and so on. Sure, sure. Small proportions, but the big winner in this region was the Glera. Is the perfect grape in the perfect spot, you know? So, 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 so Glera, Glera has developed into the go-to grape in, in your area. And for us, let's, let's focus just for a moment on, on uh, Adami in the United States. Here, um, the wine that most people I think would be familiar with would be the Garbel. Mm -hmm. And the Garbel, can you talk just for a minute about two things? One is about Garbel in particular, because we focused on a lot of the diversity. Uh, can you lift the bottle up? Oh, you there we go. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about the diversity and how that helps Adami, which was the first winery to create a single vineyard crew wine with the uh, Vigneto Giardino. But this wine that you're holding up right now is the wine that, uh, that we focus on a lot. It's probably... Um, the best value in the portfolio, the, certainly the most accessible. Um, and can you talk about two different things? One is the Garbel in particular and the sourcing that you do to pull that together. Um, as you said, you know, some people can always do it a little bit cheaper and Adami always wants to do the highest quality possible uh, for that particular value. So talk about the sourcing of this wine and also talk about a little bit more. You said that Franco, what is he? Franco doesn't make wine. Franco makes, he makes these base wines, right? Can you mm -hmm. talk about what he's thinking about a little bit further in terms of the fizzy base wine that we're talking about? Um, and just as an aside, when we get to that, um, it's very different than making champagne, okay? Method Champenoise is fermented in the bottle. With Method Champenoise, we're making up a base wine and then it's re doing a second fermentation in the bottle just the way um, Adami does. But Adami does a hundred second fermentations a year. And uh, your average uh, champagne or sparkling wine producer does one. And the reason is because it's set aside um, for years and years and years. So it has uh, a lot of time on the yeast for the yeast to fully autolysize, two, three, four, five, you know, 10 years, depending on what, on what we're talking about. Whereas Adami is all about freshness, brightness, acidity, and fruit salad. So talk if you could just for a minute about the Garbel and the sourcing, and then also about base wines. 
Yeah, as far as the Garbel goes, in terms of winemaking, uh, all our, well, not seven, except the Sulje Vito, six of our seven products are made exactly in the same way. So you take the Vigneto Giardino, you take the Concredas, you take the Garbel, Bosco di Chica. The winemaking is the same, the process of wine, of making them. Uh, the difference is where the grapes come from. So in the case of these two, I showed you before the taste profiles of Farna di Soligo compared to Colbertaldo and the different interpretations. Uh, in the case of Garbel, which by the way, is the only wine that we do with a flat horizontal label because it's flat vineyards, vertical labels, vertical vineyards, so Valdobbiadene. So it means this comes from a slightly different area, which is lower. On the map that I showed you before, here you see all our production area, but the flat area is where we make the Garbel. This means it's very close to the mountains anyway, but it's simply not on hills. But we are not far, far away at all from the, from the Dolomites, from the mountains. So two, three, four, five, six kilometers right. away, but not 30, 40 or 80 kilometers away. So for the DOC Treviso, we think it's the best possible place uh, to make a DOC Treviso. That's why we make it in the, still in the three villages, basically. So mainly it's made uh, there. Uh, I forgot the other question, Brian. Oh, the sparkling wine. Uh, yes, we don't make vino, we make base spumante. We, we could make vino. I mean, theoretically, it's allowed to make a still Prosecco, but then in the years, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 60s, and so on, when people went to the enological school, they studied, they said, with this grape variety, uh, what's the best I can do out of this grape variety? So you take any grape variety worldwide, you compare... I don't know, Pinot Noir with Cabernet Sauvignon or with Syrah, it depends. Those grapes are different depending where you grow them. But yeah. even, even, uh, even then, uh, the DNA is different. Franco Adami says a grape variety is like a human being. So one person can be taller and thinner. One person can be, can be more, uh, um, uh, I don't know, more ideal to, to be a rugby player. Some other people are good for swimming in terms of athletics, and some are good to play tennis. We're not all made in the same way. Right. We're all good, but not in the same way. So for this reason, the Prosecco uh, wine and the Glera grape, most people around here, eventually, because 99.8% is made into sparkling, they think the best possible expression for this grape is for it to be sparkling, because it's a light-bodied grape. It doesn't necessarily age uh, as well as other grape varieties. So, but we have a good acidity because of our latitude and because right. of our altitude. Hey, speaking so, of grapes, um, or a base spumante. <clears throat> speaking and of grapes, about, yeah. Oh, um, and the other thing was in in the DNA of this grape is that it's good when it's young, fresh, young, six, twelve months, eighteen, twenty-four but it doesn't get better after five years, six years, eight years, 10 years. So of course, back in the days, people tried to make it still, they made it sparkling, method Italiano, method Martinotti, or method classical, so Charma, Champenois. People made experiments, some, some they're still doing experiments. And you're allowed to do it in the bottle, in tank, you can do the fermentation as you want, but the best possible method at the end of the day was by making the second fermentation without the aging process in contact with the yeast. Because if I leave my Vigneto Giardino for three years in a cellar with the yeast, I lose all my fruit salad. That's the point. So the typicity of this wine is the complexity of the Macedonia, the fruit salad. With the yeast, the, the yeast would overpower it. So I would lose the typicity and the taste profile. And, and well, let, me, let me just interrupt you there for just a minute. So. Um... One of the key differences between this and, and, and traditional champagne is that separation where we're not getting that yeast influence. We're not getting an autolysis of the yeast into the wine. We're not getting that bread-like um, complexity. Instead, we're really focusing on the freshness and the brightness and the fruit of what we love about Prosecco. Now, Prosecco might be changing a little bit. Um, some of the things that we're hearing a lot about is, is rosé Prosecco. Obviously, rosé has exploded around the world. There's a lot of interest in that. What are you seeing happening in terms of rosé Prosecco in your backyard? And what is Adami's take on that? And what are some of the grapes that people are using to make rosé where it's found? So again, back to the map, it depends where. So you can make Prosecco rosé 
here and here, but not on the heels. Right. So con uh, Prosecco Superiore, uh, as it is now, as it's always been, it's gonna be only white. In the DOC Treviso DOC areas, you can add Pinot Nero to make eventually a rosé. Uh, we will never make it probably because we never made it because there is no tradition in it. Right. Because we don't have Pinot Noir, because we never grew Pinot Noir. And we don't think it would add uh, anything special to the taste profile of the grape variety of the Glera. As a matter of fact, the only grape variety that Dami uses, some vintages in the Bosco di Gica and the touch in the Galvez sometimes, is a touch of Chardonnay, which is allowed. So two, three, four percent more for the mouthfeel, for the fattiness. But other than that, if you put more, uh, if you put more than a certain percentage, 10, 15 percent of, of an external grape variety into the Glera, you're actually, actually overpowering it. So it wouldn't really make sense, at least to us. Uh, but, you know, 85% uh, of the Prosecco worldwide, theoretically, they can make all those if they decide to. So that's fine. Um, you mentioned that uh, only certain areas can, can make rosé, and obviously those are the less prestigious areas. Those are the areas with larger yields. Those are the areas that are more in the Pianura, on the flats, than up in the mountains. Do you have any statistics on the number of hours that are spent in mountain vineyards, maintain them versus the flats, the amount of effort and energy that, that go into these vineyards. And I said earlier um, on the introduction that these are very chaotic vineyards. Normally vineyards are very, you know, they look like, they look like my shirt, right? They're, 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 they're laid out in a grid pattern. They're a bunch of lines. Your vineyards are the exact opposite because your vineyards follow this incredible topography. It's some, it really reflects the diversity of the region more than anything because you don't try and implement man's take on this particular slope. You follow the line of that topography, um, which creates very, very, well, the vineyards are very steep, but it also makes it very challenging to work in those vineyards. How much extra work is it? Yes, yeah, so in one picture, this is just a, what, a flat vineyard. Uh, and this is a hilly Valdobbiaga and Superiore vineyard. So you see the, the difference also uh, visually. Uh, working flat or hilly, there is also many people don't know, but there is a difference in yields allowed for Prosecco. So on the hills, you can grow 30% less in terms of yields. Uh, pretty much everything is made by hand on the hills because obviously the steeper you go, the less you can work with machines, with uh, tractors, even cutting the grass, you have to do by hand. So you go from probably, let's say, 120, 150 hours, 300, 400, up to 700 hours. Wow. Work per year, per hectare. So more than, more than twice the amount of work, and I, I would guess you probably get at least half the yield that you're getting. So it becomes... Yeah, yeah they, we, I mean, here you do 100% with... 150 hours, here you do 70% with 700 hours. Potentially, I mean, some vineyards are like this, some are like this, depending, mm -hmm. you know, but because the area is like this. But the steepest possible vineyard, it's about 700 hours of, uh, of work per year per hectare. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, Enrico, what's the, can you hold up the cover of that, that Bible, that book that you got so much information from? Is that available? So that's clearly just an Italian version. Unfortunately, it's not available. This was made when Frank Adami was president of the Consortio. It was a study, a pre-study, or actually pre, the first study was 1874, the one I showed you before. Uh, this was 2007. This was made just before this era became the OCG Superiore. Uh, and it's the derive concept, so the terroir of the Conegliano Valdobbiadene, uh, trying to study it, but also to inform the people, the producers that we have around here. Here we have 4,500 right. growers, you know. So having all this information for them to see uh, and for us to study shows really how 15 villages can be very different. And it shows how it can be perhaps, and it can make sense, to make, yes, Prosecco Superiore, but from Colbertaldo or another producer is from a different area and he makes another Rive from his own little vineyard. So uh, I have to point out that lately when uh, journalists come in the area, yes, they try 20, 30, 50 brut or extra dry from different companies, but lately they've done that for, eight, for years. Lately, some of them, they just say, can I just try the Rive? 
So they try, I don't know, six, 16 different micro places, all brood. And you will see how this area will be different than this one. I mean, this is really the terroir. This is, Bordeaux is good, but Santa Steph and Santa Millon can be different, right? That's really the, that's really the concept. Can you all still hear me? Hello? Hey, Enrico, Brian dropped out just for a second. So we're still here, oh. you're still here, all good. Hey, we have just a couple other uh, questions. Can you talk quickly about the Day Cazelle, the name uh, meaning and where it comes from? The Day Cazelle is basically, I call it the brother of the Bosco di Gica. So those mm -hmm. are our two Prosecco Superiore, they are our main products kind of like. They are the same thing because it's the same vineyards. Uh, but the vineyards are, of course, fermented separately, and then the cuvee is different. So the cuvee I make for this wine here compared to the cuvee I make for this one, they're going to be different because the goal is to make a brut here, which is a specific style, and here I want to make an extra dry. So mm -hmm. in order for both styles and both bottles to be balanced, to make sense, to be asciutto, to be clean and dry on the palate, I need to start with a different base wine because at, at the end of the day, this is going to be fruitier, creamier, rounder. The Bosco di Gica is going to be a bit more acidic and a bit more food friendly, a bit drier. So if I start with the same base spumante, I cannot really have two different styles. I need two different base wines to obtain two different styles, more aperitif, more for food. They're all light and easy drinkable, but generally speaking, some people prefer either this or this. It's a, uh, some people love more this, some more this, but they're both good actually. So, and and the name De Cazel, it's a nickname for the Adami family. But yes, what does it mean? Uh, De Cazel, we have uh, locally there are several Adami. I don't know, 30, 70, I don't know, quite a few. I show you. Uh, I will show you in a second if you can come here. The De Cazel. I show you the the nickname. Right. Those are Adami, yes, but De Cazelle. So these two here from those 50, 70 families, this family, since four generations, they said, oh, you can go away. <laughs> so they say uh, the grandfather of Franco and Armando lived in a small house for a period of time because there was a landslide. And since then, this family that had 13 kids, uh, they said, oh, you are the Adami that lived in the little house lived in the day Cazelle, in the little house. So since then, the, this family Adami is called Adami, yes, but which one? Adami Day Cazelle, it's the nickname. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Sure. Um, let's see, we've got a few more questions here. Um, you, Adami does make a cartice. We don't sell yes. a lot of it in the US, but can you talk just a little bit about that as well? Yes, the Cartizza is basically a vineyard, a fairly famous vineyard. Uh, actually, 1933, when we first made a single vineyard Prosecco, Abele Adami made two single vineyard Prosecco. One was called Riva Giardino Asciutto. The other one was called Riva Cartizza Asciutto. So basically, those two vineyards were selected over 80 years ago uh, from <clears throat> uh, Abele Adami. They are basically about one mile, one kilometer away from each other. Vigneto Giardino is a little bit more south. This is a little bit more north geographically. This is more sand soil. Vigneto Giardino is more conglomerate, a bit of sand. They are close by, but they are slightly different. Uh, but both are made into a more premier and rounder style. Uh, for the Cartice, we historically have about five growers, very small growers that give us the grapes. Whereas with the Civigneto Giardino, by today we own uh, almost nine acres. So this is all estate grown, where for the Cartice we make it historically, but it's grapes that we buy from different growers. Hour now. So if we've got maybe uh, one more question or so. Uh, Brian, after seven o'clock, because it's a parity time in Italy, the questions are going to be $10, okay? 
<laughs> yeah, because Franco Adami just arrived, Carlo arrived, a good friend and colleague. We, we are a little bit thirsty, you know? So, bravo, bravo, bravo. Well, this is uh, this is the wine that's uh, that's readily available. We love what Adami's been working on for a hundred years. We love our uh, our decade and a half relationship with you guys, and uh, we can't wait to uh, be able to get back out and visit once again, or have you out here as our guest. Um, in the meantime, uh, these wines are readily available throughout the United States. So I encourage everybody to go out and make your day a little bit better with a glass of uh, of Adami Prosecco. Uh, grazie mille, Enrico. It's it's always a treat to be with you. Grazie a voi. Grazie. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> Ciao, grazie. Terrific. You guys are the best. Bye. Ciao, Bye. Branco, Bye. Presidente. Generation Bye. three, generation four. Ah, eccolo. <laughs> Ciao, you guys. Ciao, grazie. Thanks so much. Ciao, Ciao. Ciao. Grazie, Brian. Grazie a tutti.